Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me today. This is Hashtag No Limits. I am your host, Shelly Kino. Hashtag No Limits is about people whose society places limits upon but who have busted through those limits. Ophelia says in Hamlet, we know who we are, but not what we will be. And I believe that to be 100% true and that there is no better example of that than the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. For those who don't know, the caterpillar literally dissolves into its cells and then it reforms into the butterfly. That can't be an easy task. And then it has to struggle in order to get out of the cocoon in order for its wings to be strong enough to fly. And so while none of that is easy, I can't imagine that it's um, easy to break through the limits that people in society place upon us. And so today I have with me three guests who are co-authors with a group of people who weren't who aren't here today. Um, and they're going to talk about a, how they got into this group to begin with, this particular book that they have uh, brought with them and that they're part of. And I'm not going to give you any of that information. You have to wait till it's their turn to talk. Um, so I do just want to welcome everyone that is joining us in the audience. Please be sure to put into the comments a hashtag live if you're watching with us live and where you're joining us from today. Um, if you are watching this in the replay, thank you for watching it and do the same thing so that I can see where everybody is joining me from. So without further ado, thank you, Vivette Dukes, Dr. Paul Bloomberg, and Dr. Ingrid, Ingrid Twyman for joining me today. I'm so glad that you all could be here. So Vivette, how are you? And give us a little history about yourself. Hi, thank you for having me. First of all, I come to you from New York City. I am a career educator, an English educator, middle and high, high school. I've taught in the New York City Department of Education and across Long Island. My real wheelhouse is disrupting the school to prison pipe pipeline that disproportionately mm -hmm. impacts the black and brown community. So when we talk about hashtag no limits, the limits that we place on certain children, and um, that was the impetus for um, being invited to write this book alongside how do we get parents and educators to work together as being on the same team? How do we build relational trust? How do we come together and find that narrow strip of unity, which is our shared love for our children, children who we must uphold their dignity and their self-efficacy at all costs. So that's really who I am and why I'm here and I have the honor of meeting Paul a couple of years ago. It hasn't even been that long, three years ago during the pandemic through a mutual friend of ours who actually wrote one of the forewords, Marisol Quevedo Rerucha. She introduced us, we met on Zoom and we instantly hit it off and the rest as they say is history, here I am. Well, thank you. Welcome. Um, so I want to say hi to Kenna, who is joining us from Kansas, and to Leah, who is joining us from Pittsburgh. Thank you both for joining us today. All right. So Dr. Ingrid, tell us about yourself, please. Hello. Uh, how funny, Vivette, that we have like <laughs> our similar person that brought us together, right? Might as well. <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> Um, I a figure. <laughs> I know. This will be a big shout out to Mari today. Um, I am in the Southern California area. I most of my career in Los Angeles as a middle school teacher and principal, and working in Northeast LA and the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Um, very similar to Vivette. Like my passion is supporting communities that have been marginalized for, for years historically and through culturally responsive sustaining education. So really just helping schools, teachers, communities, families, students, understanding the role of culture and education and how we leverage that um, cultural lens in all of our practices, policies, systems, so that we can create um, opportunities for all of our students and families um, to just live a humane life and be, you know, just, just have love and joy in life. Um, and again, very serendipitously through uh, the same friend of the vet and I have in common, um, also was Paul's friend in common as well. Um, so just in doing the work as former principals in the Southern California area, we have connected for so many years and just 
you know, when you start doing the work for so many years and you find the right people, it just, it's through people that you know, and just have that same passion and vision. And so I think that's definitely what brought me to the core collaborative and then being able to partner with Paul and the, and the whole team of just looking at stuff that was already being done really well around formative assessment, um, which is not even like my expertise area at all, but like thinking about it from that cultural lens was like the spin that I was able to like really think through and get creative and excited about. Um, so I've learned a lot through the process and I'm super excited to be part of this team. So. Awesome. Well, thank you. So glad to have you. So we also have Fran joining us from Southern Illinois. Welcome. Mm -hmm. And we have Danielle from Long Island and Shay, who doesn't say where she's from, but I know she's from Texas. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, um, all of you that are watching. So Dr. Bloomberg, tell us about yourself and your history and what brings you to the CORE Collaborative. And then after you do that, if you would explain a little bit about what the CORE Collaborative is, kind of maybe where it started and what its purpose is. Yeah, well, um, my name is Paul Bloomberg and I'm the CEO and founder of the CORE Collaborative. But I think just a little bit about me, very similar to Vivette and Ingrid, um, just have always really been devoted to public education, started my career as a high school band director which nobody really knows. I have my master's in music and was a professional saxophonist for a while. And I think that really drew me into formative assessment because formative assessment is all just about amplifying feedback to learners in any which way that you can. Um, and was a teacher and really decided after my high school tenure that I missed the classroom and went um, and became a K-5 teacher and instructional coach in, um, inner city Denver, and have really been following that journey ever since, became an assistant principal in the San Diego area, um, worked in the district office of San Diego Unified, and then also was really lucky to get uh, a principalship around five miles from the border of San Diego, um, um, Tijuana, and was really lucky to meet a really great group of teachers and parents, and we were really able to turn around our school and i think that just sent me into doing this work on the national level and doing a lot of work around school transformation um do a lot of work with teams i have another book with um, um barb pitchford a best-selling book leading impact teams they kind of started all of this so yeah that's awesome yeah, it's interesting when you have experience in an area um, that you haven't before and you realize that there is a spark in you that you didn't know was there. For me, that was kids in special education and more specifically kids with unwanted behaviors. When I first got into a group of uh, into a classroom where I had a group of kids that fell under those categories, I was like, whoa, I love this. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, and then dealing with talking with parents and and you know collaborating with parents, um, that's a lot about what my book is about. So um, it's nice to to speak to fellow authors and to hear fellow teachers also talk about you know those things that sparked you. So um, I do want to ask you, Paul. Um, so how much do you pay Marisol to have these introductions to these other people? Like, does she get a per person commission or? How does I that wish. Work? I wish. <laughs> I mean, she could have both of our sons. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, no. I don't she, know that she uh, would want that. What's, no, what's, really, what's, really what's really interesting is Metasol and I met as principals. And so we were principals in the same district. And then we became really close then. But then we reconnected when we had our annual Minefield event. She was thinking about leaving her... Um, she was working for the county office. I said, hey, um, come to our annual event, Minefield. And she did. And we reconnected. And we've been connected ever since. Mm -hmm. And then she's just introduced me to all these other incredible people. So yeah, she deserves <laughs> a lot. She deserves a lot. Millions and millions. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll let you take care of that payment for her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't got it. But hey. <laughs> you know. 
hopefully the gratitude that you've all expressed to her on today's episode will, you know, make her feel like she's, she's getting paid something. Um, even though I'm, yeah. I don't know her, but I know teachers in general and we don't do what we do for, because we want the pay because if we did, we wouldn't yeah. be doing it. So <laughs> Yeah, you're right about that. <laughs> Unfortunately. So Bart is also joining us from Palm Springs, California. So hey, Bart, I've been talking to you in hey, email. So thanks for joining <laughs> us today. Um, nice to meet you as well. So tell me um, and tell uh, tell the audience why, what has happened over the years that um, there has been the need for the Amplify Learner book that you all, that you all have put out together? Um, I don't even think it's been the last few years. I think it's been a need for as long as I've been in public education, um, and education in general. And I think for us, like my two sons really struggled. They're both adopted. My husband and I adopted them. And I think we founded the company because we didn't want any other kids to go through what they went through and school and i think that's a big reason for the book as well and i think that everyone on this call all of them speak for themselves as we've had these experiences with assessment and grading in general that are not life-giving and they do not build you up and they do not really show you what you know they're focused on the deficit and what you don't know and they're not really robust enough to give you information about the whole learner, about how they feel, about their perception of themselves as a learner, about you know their own cultural identity and how that fits in to their learner identity. And so I think it's long overdue and it's there's only one of two books of its kind and our book is a more practitioner book. So there's really only one book of its kind, but it's really looking at self and peer assessment, reflection and goal setting through an asset-based cultural lens. And I think it's way overdue. All teachers in the country are evaluated on assessment for learning. However, when you go and do the work in schools, you rarely ever see it. And so I think it was taking assessment for learning, which we already know accelerates learning a lot, more than doubles the speed of learning, and then really infusing an asset-based cultural lens. I mean, that's the big reason for me, but I think Ingrid and Babette might have other reasons for this book. Sure. Um, to, yeah, to add to that, I think we are also really like very intentional about what is in control, what the teachers can control, like at the classroom level. And so we know that like through formative assessment, I mean, there's so much, like you said, blame, sorting, shame, and like in like large assessment systems that we're sort of bound to, at, unfortunately, it, and so what, what can we do to help teachers become empowered to who know the learners and can know they're doing the work that they that the students deserve without also being labeled as, you know, for their results on assessments as well. Right. Um, and so I think that was really important too to see what's practical. And then just like elevating the practices that teachers do, obviously pretty you know, might be doing second nature, but then not knowing that intentionality behind, again, the cultural piece to it and this framework that we can talk a little bit more about, the things that we're doing, that if we just sort of talk about and articulate them more and are more explicit, we're just going to make our practices even stronger. And students are going to, it's going to be more transparent for students so that they become the empowered learner themselves and then they direct the learning, which is what our, our ultimate goal is. So, yeah. Vivette, what are your thoughts on this? We all just experienced a global pandemic, which really shifted education as we all knew it. And while it was really disruptive, it caused like this necessary step back. Remember, we were all reimagining education, reimagining, and part of our reimagination was the writing of this book because students were and families were thrusted into this new way of learning and assessment is part of that learning. And our children spend the bulk of their formative years in school. So how are we, how are we assessing them? But more importantly, how are they assessing themselves? What does that even look like? What does that mean? Like totally 
throwing out these antiquated, archaic ideas about what assessment should be and what that means about the child. Because so much of their work is wrapped up in the score that they get on a test. And if they're not achieving that, what that does to their ever so mm -hmm. tender spirits that we are responsible for nurturing and shepherding. At least that is my philosophy. My humanizing pedagogy as an educator is to tend to the child and look at them in a holistic view and not just looking at what answers or questions they got the wrong answers to, which all too often is the way that assessments are doled out and looked at. So just on a moral level, just giving and receiving feedback in a way that's compassionate that moves learning forward. That is super important and an impetus for writing this book. And then for me, and I think for all of us here who have been classroom teachers creating a caring classroom culture, that beloved classroom community where assessment is part of it. You know, we are here to learn and to say, okay, how can I move forward? Like, okay, where did I struggle? But doing it in a way where it's productive struggle. It's a struggle where you lean into it because you feel supported in leaning into it. And being partners with the students, with their families, what funds of knowledge they bring. Um, I worked for four years at Eagle Academy for Young Men of Southeast Queens. It's just a net of schools um, erected to disrupt the school to prison pipeline. So the bulk of the students in the school are black and brown from the schools within New York that comprise, they have the highest population rates of the prisons in New York. So these are the communities where the prisons are populated from. I saw beautiful young black and brown boys who would make beats on the table and do things that like Shelly to your field would be considered disruptive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They weren't in vain with the way that school goes as kind of lockstep structure. But then I was able to find ways like, okay, how can I use that to help assess them? What is it that mm -hmm. they're demonstrating by doing this? How can we, right? So just, we just put all of that and all of us coming together with our level of expertise, our lived experiences to say, how can we assess our students in a way that's really culturally responsive, that's sustainable, that means something, not just when I get on the test, oh, 90, and throw it away. Like right. I saw too much of that or getting the paper and covering it because there's so much shame associated with it. Shame, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? so that's why we wrote it something new it was needed you need something fresh out there because yeah it's needed i'll leave it at that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so something that you mentioned vivette and i would like um you to elaborate a little bit more it just for anybody who's in the audience who might not know because i have used this phrase before and people have looked at me because they don't know exactly what it means but that school to prison pipeline can you tell, can you describe what that is and, and tell what that um, information is used for? Absolutely. So uh, research shows that by the time a student is in third grade, if that student is not reading on grade level, a prison cell is built for them. That is because the investors in the prison industrial complex are so certain that children who are not reading on grade level, who are not engaged authentically in school, are slowly but surely through a series of ways ushered out of school and into prison. So what that looks like is those disruptive students who are sent a lot to the dean's office and miss a lot of class. This whom their home lives and the experiences of their neighborhoods are not taken into consideration in the school buildings in which they attend school and by the educators and administrators who are responsible for shepherding their educations. And as a result, they have higher dropout rates. They are missing school and 
end up not by happenstance. I want to be clear. The School to Prison Pipeline is a very orchestrated set of mm -hmm. rules that disproportionately impact black and brown students. So mm -hmm. research shows that black and brown students are over policed in school. Both their minds and their bodies are over over governed in a sense. And whatever you're looking for, you're going to find it. The school to prison pipeline is wrapped up in the implicit biases of the educators who sit before students and assess them. And so now they can slowly be deemed, oh, well, you should be in special education. You shouldn't be in general education. There are all these like series of steps that happen that end up with um, black and brown students boys with an increasingly high population of our girls. They're the highest growing population of students who end up in prison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I was really surprised. I do teacher trainings in my area and I was really surprised when I used that phrase and some of the younger teachers in the room did not know what I was referring to. Hmm. And I'm not sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> Honestly, I think it's, you know, because they can be demonstrated behaviors that actually are contributing to the school to prison pipeline and not even know it. And in some states and areas, it's the school to prison to deportation pipeline. So we don't want to forget that piece also where students are now deported, separated from families. It's really quite a mess in our school system. Yeah. For sure. And um, Katie, has, I, Catherine, I know I inter she introduced herself to me as Katie. So and she does say Katie from Chicago. I'm so glad you could join us, Katie. Um, I actually, that's how you all came to be here today is because I met Katie at a conference and then she took the information back and then the rest, as you said earlier, is history. <laughs> so, it's all about connection, isn't it? It is. It really, really yeah, yep. is. Um, and so Shay says, assessment is critical. However, using it the way to help a child, not damage the child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so so much of, of what you were saying, Vivette, absolutely resonated with me as a special education teacher that, mm -hmm. you know, getting those tests back and having them all marked up in red. And, you know, yeah. the kids, the, the, the teachers, the kids, first of all, feeling horrible because they have put their best effort into it. And then the teachers, um, forgetting that we're in classrooms to educate. And, you know, they don't, I've, I've, I've talked to teachers over the years about, you know, you have to remember that, that that's why we all went into education was to educate whoever walked into our room. We're there to help students mm -hmm. learn. So if they miss a bunch of questions on a test, then go over that with them. Talk about, you know, because you want them to understand the concepts. You don't want to, as you said, just get the test and, oh, that's my score and I'm going to move on. Yeah. But I think, I think so much of what we do in education, and I, and I think it comes from the higher up, not necessarily even within our own buildings or districts, but legislation, yeah. Yeah. that we yeah. have to get through so much material in a year. Yeah. And we don't use assessments correctly. So Ingrid, you had mentioned the formative assessment. So can you give a little bit more definition about what that means as far as you all are in the way that you all are using it in the in how it's used in the book? Sure. And I'm glad you, you kind of brought that second point about the teachers don't intentionally go in right to harm students. It's, it's, it's a system too that we've as, as educators are under um, the pressures, like you said, whether it's from policy or from the district, from the building level, um, because of of our own, um, you know, wanting not wanting to feel shame on our students, not showing <laughs> progress on on whatever test or assessment they're given. So, I know it, it stems from like years of teaching under those conditions, um, and so we're trying to help again bring it to the classroom level, where with the formative assessment process of having students well one one i think setting a strong purpose for learning with students and doing that through i mean having really clear learning intentions with students and then co-constructing what success looks like with students so giving them ownership with that collectively as a community 
And that might look a little different for different students. They can really decide kind of what's going to be success for me as long as we're still, you know, meeting the, the same goal. Um, so that there's a way to give students that power to understand themselves as learners. And then using, you know, those progress, those kind of checkpoints to monitor progress toward that, that criteria, which I love the part of that I love, I think is my favorite is students peer, and well, one self and peer assessing. So one being able to know how I'm doing as a learner, not just waiting for the teacher to tell me because that's, our kids are so dependent on getting that, that historical feedback, the red on the paper, like whatever right. that looks like, it's just, that's what we've been ingrained to get and receive. But how amazing is it for kids to be able to assess themselves and then do that with peers in a safe environment, like you mentioned, Vivette, having that community of learners, that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay, we're, all, you know, we're progressing maybe individually and we have our, our own way to success. And that might look different based on our cultural background, our language, gifts or funds of knowledge, all of that. So I think it it's just, again, the process is, is an ongoing process in the classroom that teachers can have a little bit more control of without this over looming, um, you know, big major assessments that we're always so hyper-focused on. Right. And speaking of evaluating teachers, I was just applying earlier this week to be a presenter at, I don't remember which conference because I'm applying to the, all of them all the time. Um, but but one of the boxes that it asked me was, which Danielson framework mm -hmm. does this fit into? Sure. And I thought, you know what? We're too focused on that. Yeah. yeah. And for, for anybody that doesn't know, who's the expert on the Danielson framework that wants to just give a brief synopsis to the audience? All right, Paul. <laughs> I think her framework is like the Marzano framework is like the T-test framework, but there's specific domains around effective teaching from building a community to assessing kids to being clear about your objectives and it's just some common practices that we can all agree on that are best practice now the way it's used sure. it's it initially was supposed to be a coaching tool and it's mm -hmm. a wonderful coaching tool but in america's um, you know, and always trying to evaluate and quantify everything, it's turned into quite an evaluation tool from state to state to state. And there's other tools like it, but it's turned something that has been, that was, I think, a relatively good, solid tool, and it's turned it more value. So in, in essence, it was a formative tool, formative yeah. assessment, and it's now being used more as a summative tool. Right. Right. And yeah, well, you could, that, yeah, you could make your own goals. Remember when we first started it and teachers had their own pathways and it was like yep. such a great tool. To, yep, exactly. Yep. Yeah, and it's it's mm -hmm. not anymore. It was used, um, so Isaac's joining us. Hi, Isaac from Southeast Kansas. Hey, Isaac. Um, and so, yeah, when I, just as I left teaching, I am no longer full-time teaching. I've been out, I guess this is my sixth year now, um, that, that Charlotte Danielson was just becoming the norm of how teachers were being evalu evaluated here in Illinois. Mm -hmm. And I remember, yeah. you know, there was like 72 different areas and each area was given a certain number of points and you wanted to get, you know, between this many and this many points, but you couldn't get, you really weren't supposed to get higher than this many because nobody is that good always. And I mean, I was like, oh my yeah. gosh, mm -hmm. you know, sure. I was just like, you know, I was, I didn't get out because of that, but I've actually heard that from some teachers that they're like, this is ridiculous. Like every little thing that I do now is graded. And yeah, know, yeah. I understand having parameters and I understand that and, and I agree with the fact that we need to hold our teachers to a standard, um, you know, mm -hmm. and how we figure out that standard and how we assess if they're living up to that standard. I'm not in agreement that the Danielson method and maybe some of the other ones are the right ways to do it. But unfortunately I don't have the right answer. So, um, yeah. So, so how does this look in, um, okay. So I'm, I'm in middle America. So how does it, how does this look your, your book and what it's in, instructing the teachers to do here in middle America on the East coast and the West coast? Cause we've got, We've got all three of those areas represented here today. So does it look different? Does it look the same? What are your thoughts? I think formative assessment is a process that involves kids at every level, you know, from developing the expectations with them 
and relying on their funds of knowledge to do that. So wherever you are, it doesn't matter because it's embracing everyone's cultural identity. It's not embracing one identity or identities over another. It's really leaning in into assuming that kids are coming to us with a lot of knowledge instead of assuming that they're not. So I think this framework works really well wherever you go, as long as you're open-minded and are willing to kind of live in a mess. You know, it's messy and learning is messy. And so it's developing those expectations with kids, refining those expectations as you move through the process, and then having kids set goals and reflect on their learning and assuring that everyone is making progress. Maybe not everyone being proficient because everyone's starting in a different place, but really being clear with kids and building a progression of learning for them that's relevant to them personally, that's driven by the things that are important to them. And so I think in that respect, you can do this work everywhere. We were just up in Alaska. It's where we kind of did our first session on it. And Rachel and I, another author, we were really shocked at how much people just valued this process and understood that this process is something that you could do with all kids because all kids are really brilliant if they're given an opportunity to drive, you know? And so it's really about letting them drive and giving them feedback along the way and partnering with them and lowering the power that lives in the classroom. But I, I feel it works all over the world. You know, we got some work. I think we're going back to South Africa and this is gonna be a core of the work. So I don't think it lives in any one region. What about you, Ingrid or Vivette? What are your, what's your thinking? I'd have to agree. It's just grounded in humanizing pedagogy. It's grounded in the humanity of that we all share. So it's not about, oh, this fits for this student in this box. Again, we're trying to break out of boxes because boxes are flawed and boxes can be biased. This is about what innate talents and gifts do you have on the inside of you that through education and that collaborative environment in your classroom, in your school community, where you can now be assessed in a way that pulls that out, that you're a part of that assessment. Even that notion is mind blowing for some people, for some educators, what? This can co-construct. Yes, they are. They have their own working knowledge of things, their own ideas about things, about what that means and how they can learn and grow and what they want to learn and what they want you to know about them. And then you can get to, well, what am I scared to try? Why? And then creating an environment where they can actually do that thing like that's a win, 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 win. And that has nothing to do with where you live, what zip code you live in, the color of your skin, who you love. Your race. That's nothing. It has to do with having blood flowing through your veins and yeah. breathing, just wanting to feel like good every day. Because who doesn't want that? Yeah, but I think it's also understanding that all those things, your culture, those are assets your lived experience that you're bringing into the classroom is an asset that we need to learn about because believing the kids are coming in and, and are empty vessels, they have so much knowledge, more than they ever have before. And it's how do we harness that? How do we dance with them? Not run a factory, how do we dance with them? Sometimes they take the lead, sometimes we take the lead. Sometimes we observe, sometimes they observe. But I always kind of imagine this sort of assessment, cultural response with Sassania, it's a dance that you do with learners and it's inclusive and you're letting everyone be, belong and be a part of it because it's about learning just as much about yourself as a learner and how can we learn about others? And I think it's, it's different. Ingrid, I think you have a different, maybe even perspective. Well, I think an addition was one of our core concepts that emerged when through this process, we, you know, came up with our core concepts, the framework, we had seven. And also an, 
a piece that I think is critical, again, going back to the humanity piece and no matter where you are in the world, really is this idea around criticality too and thinking about which means how do we also, what uh, whatever type of assessments we're putting in front of students so that it's one meaningful, relevant, and it's teaching all kids, again, no matter zip code, skin color, SES, wherever you're from, learning about others and different perspectives and being able to recognize, you know, systems and disrupting those systems as well. So if we don't, if we do this in a vacuum and our, and our formative assessments aren't pushing that type of thinking, then we're not setting our kids up also to be really, you know, change agents in our world. Um, so I think there's that element of what are we putting in front of our kids and what's the purpose for learning this content or this concept to a larger, you know, purpose that's more about humanity and becoming a better human. So I think we can be really intentional about the types of assessments that we're using with our kids to do all of the things that Paul and Vivette are talking about. So, so there's a couple of things that I want to bring out. And one of these might be a very hot button topic. And so I don't know if you all want to try it or not, but the, the so I'm going to ask <laughs> that one first. Okay. So to me, these all seem a lot like IEPs because it sounds like what you're saying is it's very individualized. Mm -hmm. It's very specific to the one person because it's about that one person. So how is that, this isn't the hot button one actually, how is that received um, with your teachers? Because I can tell you how it was received as a special education teacher and it wasn't always great. <laughs> I, think, I think there's similarities and differences our work is really collaborative because the work of formative assessment, if you look at all the research, it's a collaborative process. It requires partnering with students. And that means lowering the power position where we're partners, but it also requires kids to partner with each other. And so although the goals of a unit may be the same, where we're at on the progression of those goals, because our standards are all built in progressions, that nobody really uses, by the way. And they were designed in You these just took my hot button topic, Paul, because I was going to yeah. ask how this relates yeah. to like the common core stuff. <laughs> yeah. So they're relate, you know, so these progressions and why our next generation of standards were designed in that way. And so all kids had entry points because kids are coming in in different places, just like teachers are engaging in this work in a different spot. So where one teacher may be at, and engaging with this work may be a little different than their colleague for whatever reason. So I think that it's similar in the honor that we're honoring the student, we're honoring where they're at in the process, but the collaborative part is necessary for learning to happen. So it's a lot easier than it looks because we're still focusing on the same goals in that unit, but where we're at on the progression might be a little different and it's our job to work together as a learning community to make progress. It really doesn't matter where you're at. What matters is can you explicitly speak to the progress that you're making and do you have evidence to support that? Um, but yeah, I do think there's a lot of similarities. Um, do you guys have any insight? Do you think it's different? I was thinking of also of just how we kind of bring it back to also like just like UDL, like universal design for learning too. And thinking about, again, the, the goals of the unit might be this the same, the same outcomes and learning intentions, but there's so many different things to consider and how we engage the students in that learning their entry point that way, based on their cultural funds of knowledge, how are they expressing their learning? How, you know, how is it represented? So we can kind of use some of those same elements that we would do really for all we need to be doing for all students. Um, so I think there's that connection as well. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything else by that. I mean, I'm willing to, to go there with Common Core standards slash next generation learning standards and how this ties in. And the reality is that the standards are just that. Their standards are not the end all, they're not the be all. They are a mark. There's something like, okay, this is where we'd like to see students. What our book, Amplify Learner, Joy, Learner Voice, addresses is 
what's the pathway that you're taking to get there? And are you just a fo focused on the end result, who is, which is often arbitrary and um, placed there by someone who's very far removed from what's actually taking place in classrooms every day? What we're doing is like, you're here, you're in, you're in the cut, you're in the trenches. How are you gonna do this in a way that is dignified, that is authentic, that speaks to who children, communities, their culture, are you embedding that on your road to the standards? Cause you know, there's a road there. Are you missing some steps along with this? Amplify learner voice, voice is what's gonna help you really do it in a way that's like, you know, not only are we meeting the standards, children are engaged and happy getting there and they can tell you all about it, their experience getting there. They can go home and tell their families. It's a change agent and it's mm -hmm. what we need. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you enough. I, I really hope that any and everyone watching this podcast, listening, like go and get, a, just like, you don't have to take our word for it. Pick it up. <laughs> And see, like, seriously, like, just pick it up and see. And we welcome your feedback because mm -hmm. we've poured our heart and souls into this, really knowing that something has to change, Shelly. Something had to change I, because. Yeah, I think the. Yeah, I think that that, like, I'm right on target with everything that that is saying. I think the other thing that really sets this apart is we often assess the content knowledge. But at the, the foundation of learning is the dispositions and attitudes that we have about ourselves as learners. And so in the very first part of the chapter, the dispositional learning part, the foundation of learning, the learning how to learn part is also very integral because if we're going to advance equity, we have to teach our students how to learn on their own. And so that is built in and assuming that kids are racing to the classrooms and they have these dispositions. My son was a surfer, amazingly patient, a persevered like no other and could problem solve. Yet every day he went to school and he was told that he was lazy, that he was impulsive and that he couldn't concentrate. And if teachers would see him catching a wave, they would see that he had all those dispositions they were saying that he didn't have but they showed up when learning was relevant to him. Yep. And so that idea of the dispositional piece, that's how we get to know ourselves is the habits of learning and they're integral and they're woven throughout this book. And I think that's also kind of maybe, I wish the IEP process would consider the habits of learning because they're at the core of learning. And sometimes the kids that have IEPs they have resourcefulness. They're unbelievably patient. They have learned to cope and persevere like no other. So the dispositional strength that our kids are coming to the classroom, sometimes the teachers aren't even aware that they have those habits already intact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I can't tell you how many of my students that, and, and that's kind of where this show stems from, is from yeah. my teaching and and seeing the attitudes of members of, of the communities, the medical field, their their families, other educators that I worked with, and just this idea of they focused on the disability yeah. as opposed to the ability. And they had this idea of, you know, well, this child is only gonna ever get to hear. Or this, you know, they're they're never going to live this kind of a life. That's why I don't know if you can see the title of my book, but it's called "Those Who Can't Teach," mm -hmm. and it comes from the idea that we as teachers have that saying said about us: "Those who can do, those who can't teach." And every teacher that I've ever asked that says they don't like it, and they don't like it because it always makes us feel less than. That's exactly how the families in my book feel: is that. Yep. yep. Society has looked at them for so long and said, oh, you can't live a happy life. You can't go on a vacation. You can't be, you know, this or that. And then the individuals themselves have been told all these negative, all these can'ts. But yet at the end of each chapter that I wrote, I say all of the wonderful things that I learned 
from each of the families that are in the book because I was open to receive and sometimes felt like I received way more than I gave, <laughs> which I'm not sure that's a good thing as a teacher. But <laughs> I think good teachers feel that way though. I think when you understand that, that teaching and learning is a reciprocal process yep. and we're there to learn from our students and our families as much as we hope they can learn, from, it's the shared experience. I think this individualism, this idea that we have to be the best, that's the stuff that gets in the way when this book is all about community. This is about how we can build relation, learning relationships with one another. Yeah. yeah, I can't wait to read your book now. You sold me, I'm gonna buy it. <laughs> awesome, all right, it worked. Yeah. So while, while we're talking about your book, um, I, I do, I have the website pulled up, so I do wanna go ahead and I'm not, I've never had four people on my screen and then showed the site. So I'm not really sure what that's gonna, oh, there we go. Okay, we're all just gonna go to the side. Um, <laughs> yeah, very cool. So, so nice. this is the, um, I don't know, Paul, if you want to talk about this um, or if one of the yeah. ladies wants to talk about this. Yeah, so I can barely see, but what I can see is you can order it all there, but there's a little thing, there's a sneak peek off to the right where you can fill that in and you'll get a bunch of the early chapters okay. um, of the book and the table of contents. But down where it says online resources, if you click there, uh -huh. um, you can actually, whether you buy the book or not, you can access all the online resources. And while we're here, I wanted to shout out, there's over 30 some schools that contributed to this book. So yeah, the authors were one team, but we have um, Dr. Marion Wilson. She's a superintendent in um, Staten Island. She wrote the forum and Madison, who you heard about wrote it for, but then we have all these teachers and principals and kids that contributed to the book. So you'll see different formative tools that we explain throughout the book and those are the black line masters that you can get online and then if you look to the right there's videos so for every chapter there's different videos and we also have a youtube channel um at the core collaborative it's just core collaborative youtube where you can access all the videos so you can actually see this work in action in the classrooms alongside students and a lot of the videos are just of the students engaging in this process this is fantastic. Um, so we have a- Yeah, I think the appendix and all this took us more work than the book. <laughs> <laughs> so many. I can agree to that. Um, I'm not even kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't. Uh, so we, we do, I didn't wanna, did I already shout out to Michael and Breeze? I don't remember if I did, if not, hi, Michael and Breeze. Um, and then we have Shay saying, I use learner-centered teaching by using my students' individual goals or levels based on their likes, connections, and skills. Looking forward to reading this book and sharing with staff. So there we go. I sold one of your books, you're buying one of mine. So it's a, it's a win win today. <laughs> Is there any particular, um, like how long are these videos? I was just kind of curious if, if uh, I probably, we probably don't have time because we're, we're coming up um, on 50 I minutes think already. Out of, yeah, let, let me look, Do, go up a little bit. Let me see chapter here. Let me pull it up and I'll tell you. Okay. There is, um, actually someone has to tread water while I do this. Mm -hmm. All right. But so there is a really good one. Okay. And I'll look for it while you guys talk. Okay. Um, so tell us a little bit more, Vivette and Ingrid, about like your process in coming up with the book. And um, you've said you went up to Alaska and kind of had your first sort of lesson with it. How is it being received by teachers? As far as that I kind of back can speak to that for sure. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Ingrid, and then I'll, I'll jump in. I definitely can. Oh, yeah. Well, I was going to kind of just speak briefly on the process. Again, I think it goes back to when it was kind of a, I guess we call it what, a reboot of um, the, the Peer Power book that was um, previously published around formative assessment and, and, and creating empowered learners. And we kind of, again, in this new age of, of transition of, of how we're seeing education the last you know few years and, and knowing that it's been needed for much longer we kind of wanted to take this equity stance and kind of look at it through a cultural lens so we just sort of looked at each chapter and and found out which chapters 
where we needed, like pulling in around family connections and, and questioning and a few things that just kind of rounded out a resource for teachers that would infuse, like have some, a little bit of foundation around culture responses, sustaining education and, and threading that through each of the chapters. So kind of one, one thing I was going to, you know, maybe highlight too, is that the book is, you know, we say, we always kind of laugh. It's, it's, it's fairly meaty in there. However, um, what we, what the, the great thing about it is that, you know, you get some of the kind of foundational stuff from the intro and maybe like the beginning chapter, and then you can kind of choose your own adventure. So each chapter really, depending on your entry point as a learner, as a school, as a staff, if family engagement is you're, you're going to number, you're going to chapter two and you're starting there to really find that connection with the home. You know, there's different chapters on, on the dispositions. There's some on uh, deliberate practice, you know, so it, it's just really kind of depending on where you are in your journey with formative assessment. That's what I think is really great that you don't have to read it from page one to 400 something, wherever we're at. But, <laughs> I don't think say that out loud. Don't say that out loud. <laughs> lots and lots of great stuff in there. Yeah. So I just want to add that piece. Thank you. That's awesome. Absolutely. What the feedback that I've received really, because we I can sit here and tune it all I want, but really mm-hmm. what people receiving the book is what right, the feedback. <laughs> I want to hear mm-hmm. the feedback right. from people. Right. So um what I've heard, and this is coming from parents, so I have friends who are parents who have bought the book. Like, oh, I, I think I need to get this to learn more about what's going on with my child in school. Love mm-hmm. that it was accessible. They didn't feel like they had to have a master's degree in education oh. in order to understand what was being said. I, I count that as a win. Fellow mm-hmm. colleagues, teachers who were like, wow, this book really is just in layman's terms without being watered down and has many so many different entry points. I really mm-hmm. wanted to highlight like the structure of the book. So two things, uh, Ingrid spoke about the seven core concepts of culturally responsive and sustaining assessment that we developed as a part of the framework for the book to give it that structure. Mm-hmm. So their cultural identity, asset-centered mindset, dispositional learning, learner clarity, engagement, learning partnerships, and criticality. So already that's setting up readers of the book, say, all right, what's my jam? Why why have I purchased this book? Why am I here? And then we actually have a little tool for how to navigate Amplify Learner Voice. So there's specific chapter organization. Each chapter starts out with these driving questions, right? In true freery form, we learn by inquiry. So we have these driving questions. We have reflections at the end of each chapter, again, to like book ended with questions. Then there are the videos. I see Paul put in the chat the video. We have time to watch watch it. Um, And then formative assessment tools. So we have little frameworks, we have charts and graphs and visuals, right? We know the multiple ways that people learn and take in information. Mm -hmm. And oh, my my sister, Rachel Carrillo Fairchild, she did such a great Mm -hmm. job with the multilingual considerations for our English language learners. How are we attending to their specific needs? And then we have a Mm -hmm. glossary of so just to give you a visual or an idea of how the book is set up, it's really intentional and makes it very easy to just yeah. read those first chapters to ground you and then whoop, go where you need to. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So yeah. Um, video 5.2. So let me pull that up really quick. Okay. Oops. Uh, so I'm trying to pull it up from where, okay. Hopefully for this will be the right one. I should probably share the screen if I want you all to see it, huh? <laughs> put the screen, <laughs> put, the, put the video back up there, Shelly. Okay, here we go. Mm-hmm. All right, hopefully this is the right one. Oh, advertisements. My goodness, okay. now it's all advertised. Is that the right one? The expert groups? It's perfect. Okay. You know, this one might be, you might want to fast forward to the middle. Okay. Oh, we can't hear it. I think we're gonna have a hard time with the sound. 
Yeah, there's no sound. There's no sound. All right. Well, I thought that I had shared it so that there was sound, but maybe. No, I said it, it is sharing the audio. Hmm. Um, okay. Maybe this audio is up. Um, well, okay. We're just going to say this is the link. Um, <laughs> yep, yep. This, I can this was the, so this, yeah, so these kids are actually in this particular school, PS9, Naples Street Elementary, the kids are brought into the assessment experience and they look at data with the teacher and then they determine the mini lessons that need to be taught and the kids actually teach. And so in this particular video, the kids are reflecting on their teaching on what it felt like to be an expert. And what's really cool in this school now is a lot, it's reciprocal teaching is used throughout the school. So after the kids engage in the self and peer assessment, then they rely on one each on one another's expertise to, mm -hmm. to, to move the needle. And so in that particular video, if you want to shoot it out later, Graciela is just amazing. She kind of talks about that process. And then all of the kids are kind of reflecting on how it felt that day to be the expert, but it's really cool how Graciela has really kind of figured this out because literally the kids are looking at the assessment data with her and they're looking for learning intentions and mini lessons to teach the kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is awesome. That is very, very It cool. is awesome. All right, guys, really what? quick. We, we, we have, I, I try to keep it under an hour and we're at 56 minutes. So each of you, one final thought. We're going to start with Paul. I'm going to save you till last. Um, Ingrid, I'm going to start with you. Final thought. Um, I I just feel that this is a great time for educators to continue to push their thinking around the role of culture. Um, so just kind of having that cultural lens in all of our practices. And so thinking about it from a formative assessment lens as well, we kind of, again, bridge the two bodies of of research, bodies of knowledge, because it's also accessible. It's something that we are kind of responsible for in our classroom. So we hope that this is a way that teachers can, again, look at what they're already doing really well and then continuing to make it better um, for our kids so that our kids are seen and heard and so that their voices are amplified in the classroom. And we hope that people really enjoy digging into this. And we definitely absolutely want to hear um, like you said, feedback and just, just thoughts. And it's part of our passion and we love to discuss it and we're open to, we're very accessible. So we love to talk more about it. For sure. Awesome. So at the bottom of the screen here, I do have the link to um, the Amplify Learner Voice. This is the actual um, website for that, but I also am going to share, and for those listening on the podcast, it's www.mimi, M-I-M-I, Mimi to top, no, sorry, Mimi Todd, press dot com forward slash amplify um, dash learner dash voice dash resources. Um, and then also for all of the core collaborative, um, it is the core collaborative dot com. So make sure you check out both of those. All right. So Vivette, final thought. Well, my final thought would be that schools are increasingly becoming more culturally diverse and the assessments that we use in schools need to reflect that and simply amplify learner voice through culturally responsive and sustaining assessment is a great tool to help us achieve that that, that goal. Yeah. Um, let's, I just want the book to speak for itself. Mm -hmm. Just get it. It's here. It. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Dr. Paul, down to you. Yeah, I think um, so Mimi, who the press company was named after, was my mentor from New York City. And she was one of the most amazing coaches, consultants that I think I've ever met. She since passed and she always would tell me that we just have to trust the learners because they'll always lead the way. And so mm -hmm. I think with this book, if we can just spend more time listening to the voices of our kids, they won't ever let us down and the voices of our parents. And they will always tell us exactly what the next step is, but we have to amplify their voices. Awesome. 
Well, that was a great way to end and that's perfect timing. Thank you so much, Ingrid, Vivette, and Paul for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to get to talk with each one of you and to learn more about this book. I truly believe that this is going to be a game changer for our teachers and for our students. And I'm happy that I was able to be a part of its launch, basically. So thank you, everybody. All right. Have a good week, everybody. Yeah.